Move fast and break things was Mark Zuckerberg's famous credo for entrepreneurs. Unless you are breaking stuff, he said in 2009, you are not moving fast enough. This phrase came to epitomize the Silicon Valley startup culture that has redefined modern life in the last decade. But in government, of course, we don't want to break things. We want to fix them and improve people's lives. While the idea of breaking things is clearly ill-suited to the purpose of the public sector, moving fast does speak to the ambitions of today's enterprising public servants who want to solve public problems by doing things differently. After all, the way we are used to doing things in government is often simply too slow and too disconnected from the people we are trying to help. Our current ways of working provide little opportunity for course correction or improvement. There is widespread perception that government is simply not working well as well as it ought to. Our institutions and mechanisms for policymaking were built for a different time, an era with fewer citizens, a slower pace of information dissemination, and a data capacity that is a fraction of what we have today. In this module, you're going to first develop an understanding of the concept of the new change maker in government, or what we are calling the public entrepreneur. And second, get an overview of some of the new ways of working enabled by new technology. Third, learn how to take a project from idea to implementation in an agile fashion. Okay, let's talk about who is the public entrepreneur. Public entrepreneurs are individuals within government who are open, open to using data, open to using collective intelligence, open to trying new things. They're open to innovation and agility while holding fast to the values of the public interest. For example, let's take a look at the work of Indian biophysicist Samir Brahmchari, former Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research of the Government of India. In India, thousands of people, primarily those living in poverty, die every day from tuberculosis. Yet there has been no new TB treatment developed in 40 years, and a resistance to existing drugs is increasing. So, Samir created the Open Source Drug Discovery Project, a crowdsourcing effort to provide affordable health care to the developing world by providing a global platform where the best minds can collaborate and collectively endeavor to solve the complex problems associated with discovering novel therapies for neglected tropical diseases. By recruiting students, academics, and scientists from around the world and across India, most of whom are in remote villages, not elite universities. Samir created his own inexpensive army to collect, annotate, and extract information from the scientific literature on the TB pathogen. With a $12 million grant, he coordinated the incremental contributions of 7,500 participants from 130 countries and began clinical trials for a new experimental drug at 20% of the cost of a traditional drug. By working openly and in collaboration with a wider coalition of partners, leveraging the power of collective intelligence and big data, Samir is a perfect example of the new public entrepreneur who takes on difficult and seemingly intractable public policy problems, working in concert with others to get things done. Public entrepreneurs possess the mindset and the skill set to translate between the domains of government and technology between the customs of bureaucrats and those of hackers, and between the language of politicians and the public to mobilize resources inside and outside of government. They are not content with slow and incremental approaches, and they strive to deliver real results in a shorter time. Thus, they experiment with new ways of working. They take risks, but are certainly not reckless. They are conscious of their fiduciary obligations to due process and safeguarding taxpayer dollars and the public's trust. Okay, what are some of the new tools for public entrepreneurship? There are many new approaches to solving public problems that are transforming the performance of organizations in the public sector. We're going to focus on six of them in particular. The first approach we'll discuss is agile and iterative project management. These are concepts that find their roots in the world of software development, but we can take these same approaches and apply them to the creation of non-digital products and services, like policies, just as easily. Technology is creating the ability and the incentive to work faster than before by working smaller. Traditional government has utilized what we used to call a waterfall approach, a waterfall approach to the management of projects, where we spend years planning, designing, developing, testing, and then only later deploying a final product that we hope will be as perfect as possible without any evidence that the project will actually work. 
Indeed, government is infamous for its over-budget, delayed, or otherwise failed projects, like the U.S. Air Force's Expeditionary Combat Support System. That agency spent $1.1 billion taxpayer dollars on a software project that was ultimately scrapped. By contrast, Agile is a flexible method for chopping up a project into smaller components that can be developed and tested in shorter time frames called sprints. Under an Agile or iterative project management model, our goal isn't to reach perfection in the first go around. In fact, we accept imperfection because we know that we're going to learn from our shortcomings and become stronger as we adapt. This model is centered on a recurring process of designing, developing, testing, iterating, and repeating that process until you have an outcome that is truly effective. The explicit willingness to iterate and even fail represents a dramatic sea change in culture that is underway in many places, but by no means pervasive in government. Policymakers are borrowing many of the same agile techniques learned from technology project management and applying those techniques to developing services and policies as well. Take the example of Denmark, which instead of undertaking the design of its new corporate registration system in the old waterfall way, where the next stage cannot start until the previous one finishes, it developed the project with frequent testing of prototypes on real users. As a result, Denmark was able to launch an online company registration system faster and achieve better results. Sometimes known as Lean, as well as Agile, this new way of working emphasizes a continuous process of building, testing, and learning. From 2004 to 2015, the duration of major U.S. federal government IT projects went from an average of nine years to less than two years with concomitant cost savings because of the adoption of this approach. As part of the broader trend toward more open governing enabled by new tools, we're seeing more governments work with those outside of government by applying open innovation and human-centered design to solving problems. Henry Chesborough, a professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California at Berkeley, popularized the term open innovation to describe the distributed process of working across organizational boundaries to accelerate innovation. As governments seek solutions to big and complex problems, open innovation, often backed by the incentive of a prize and known as a prize back challenge, has enabled the public sector to widen the pool of potential problem solvers beyond the usual suspects and get good ideas from more diverse sources faster using digital platforms. The U.S. government's open innovation platform, challenge.gov, has hosted over a thousand challenges since 2010 and has engaged the public in tackling hard problems, such as improving methods to find asteroids that could threaten the Earth, to removing sediment from reservoirs. Public institutions are also turning to private platforms, such as Innocentive or Kaggle, for help attracting solvers with good ideas to solve hard problems. In 2019, the state of New Jersey launched the Engine Challenge to get good ideas from civil servants about improving government and saving taxpayer dollars. Open innovation is just one way to solve problems with the public, tapping its intelligence and expertise. In addition to adopting open innovation, agencies are also practicing the methodologies of what is known as human-centered design to deliver services more effectively. Human-centered design emphasizes answering the questions, who are we creating the service for and what are their needs? Thus, instead of starting with the blueprint for a policy, a service, or a website, practitioners of human-centered design investigate the context, the behaviors, and the needs of relevant members of the public in an effort to understand how they experience a challenge. Human-centered design practitioners also test and validate design policies or services with users to ensure that they're achieving their desired outcomes. For example, when the New Jersey Department of Labor and Workforce Development systematically talked to, observed, and interviewed job seekers in 2019, they learned that the unemployed were not suffering from a lack of tools or informational resources, but were in fact drowning in offerings aimed at helping them get a job. What they lacked was a clear pathway through the abundance of information and informed guidance about what to do and in what order. 
Therefore, instead of simply revamping the government's website with better information no one would use more than before, the agency embarked on designing an entirely new system for virtual coaching to meet the needs of job seekers for more hands-on mentoring. Working in new ways like human-centered design and open innovation also demands new kinds of organizations that are able to use these methods. Many governments have created so-called policy labs, innovation labs, reality labs, public labs, or living labs to hire people with new skills like data science and design, engineering, and anthropology who can practice these methods more easily than the rest of the bureaucracy. The UN Global Pulse is just such an experimental unit within the United Nations. It's designed to provide agile data science expertise for tackling the sustainable development goals. For example, the Swedish national government set up Experio Lab to put designers to work specifically on healthcare challenges. In Denmark, MindLab hired designers who knew how to engage citizens in the design of services. For example, MindLab ran a project with 400 teachers to redesign the country's school curriculum. Often government jobs are for life, right? The average tenure for workers in the federal government, for example, is nine and a half years far longer than the private sector median of 3.8 years. Furthermore, as we know, in government it can take forever to get a job, creating a higher incentive to keep it once accepted. David Elwood, former dean of the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government, describes it as a 19th century hiring system in which job applications disappear into, quote, a black hole, and the process can take nine months or a year to accomplish. At the state level, too, hiring can take a long time, often with little to no communication between the hiring agency and the applicant. But today, some public agencies in other jurisdictions are shifting away from closed and insular hiring practices to more networked ways of working with other sectors, where talent goes in and out using sabbaticals, exchanges, and short-term stints in government for those in the private sector, and in the private or academic sector for those in government. The Italian government, for example, recruited the head of Amazon Europe, Diego Piacentini, to spend two years as government commissioner for the digital agenda, beginning in 2016. The team he brought on to join him included people from the private sector with experience in computer science, product design, and big data, who were asked to commit to a one-year stint on the inside. What places as diverse as France and Korea are experimenting with inviting people into government, the UK is encouraging civil servants to leave government for a career break. Scotland and Ireland offer sabbaticals for public servants to go out and to come back as well. Well, on the one hand, the trend is toward f riskier forms of failing fast in human-centric lab settings. Those evangelizing for public sector reform are also embracing evidence-based decision-making to develop and evaluate interventions. The central concept here is that we should seek out relevant data and use it to drive our decision-making processes. If we're not consulting the information available to us, we may not be achieving the best outcome possible. As we discussed extensively in the last module, data is a powerful ally. For the public entrepreneur, data science is an increasingly important capability for understanding problems and their root causes. And technology has vastly increased our ability to obtain and use data in our decision-making processes. In San Francisco, for example, auto collisions between bikes and pedestrians kill more than 30 people in the city each year. To tackle the problem, the Department of Public Health and the Department of Transportation developed Transbase to visualize incidents. They quickly discovered that just 12% of intersections actually resulted in 70% of major injuries making it possible to use data-driven evidence to target and address the problem more quickly and more effectively. Okay, now that we've gotten an overview of some of the new ways of working that are making government officials more innovative, we want to close out our discussion with an overview of how to apply these new ways of working. Any public problem-solving process needs to begin with a strategy for propelling the problem-solving process forward in an agile trajectory. There is an arc to the problem-solving process with a series of practical steps that can usefully serve as scaffolding to advance any project. Every project management approach adopts such a process, which tracks steps involved in identifying a problem, developing solutions, and implementing them. 
whether the prescribed pathway comes from management or design or from policy, any project management approach is going to entail a series of steps moving from idea to implementation. Just as a private sector entrepreneur needs to reflect on what she must do from beginning to end to launch a successful business, the public entrepreneur needs to comprehend the science of what some have called deliverology and possess an overview of what is involved in solving public problems even before she dives into specific methods and tools. Starting with a loose and iterative roadmap for getting from idea to implementation, even if the decision is made to deviate from the path along the way, is an essential reflective step before beginning. That is why we end this module by pointing you to the updated public problem solving canvas published by the New York University Governance Lab. The canvas is a 20 question form, fillable online or off, for sketching out your own project pathway and previewing some of the tools you might use along the way. It asks such questions are, as what is the actionable problem I'm trying to solve? Whom can I consult with to validate my understanding of those problems? What kind of a coalition can I build to take action? We invite you to use the canvas to create an initial action plan to move your own project from idea to implementation. Thank you.